A topic for this morning is a familiar ending. And we're starting back in Zechariah, the 14th chapter, and as I mentioned before, uh, today will serve as a culmination of our study through Zechariah. And as we look at it, chapter 14 is probably one of the more challenging chapters that, that we're going to come across uh, in our study of the Old Testament related to the minor prophets, but in particular as we finish our series on the book of Zechariah. And I'll explain more in detail momentarily. However, I wanted to first begin by recapping a few pieces of the work of the Messiah. And we looked at this a couple of times, but for the purpose of uh, repetition, I, I again repeat it. Uh, so it's the first sign of the first work of Messiah was to be to bring about a restored peace. So it's, again, everything being restored, uh, being renewed as related to Israel and ultimately with, to the world. We also have discussed how Israel would be regenerated and Israel would be repentant. We saw those things in some of the pieces of Zechariah, but also in other passages it was spoken to as well. We also saw a revived worship would take place in Ezekiel chapter 40, chapters 40 through 48. Although that, that was not fulfilled, it was still in the future. And so there are a number of things that were not fulfilled literally in Israel, but they would, were still to have been in the future as they came out of captivity. Today we look in Zechariah chapter 14. And starting in the first verse, Zechariah chapter 14, and starting in the first verse, Zechariah says that, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations, all the nations, to battle against what city? Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. Zechariah writes of what was to be the, the ending of things, of how things would have, have played out, of what God's will was, what his intent was. And God is like us in the sense that even though he has a plan, the plan doesn't always go the way he has a plan. Can you imagine your frustration when you have something planned out? You're preparing a dinner and you, you've figured it out. You have guests coming and you know that you're going to have serve this, serve that, and this is how it's going to play out and function. And, and you're cooking the meal and everything is, is prepared and preparing. And then something, something goes wrong. You know, you let the yams cook too long, the tarot's cook too long. And then you're, you're, you're scrambling, right? You, you know, you're, it's hectic now because things are not going as you had planned. And you're sending somebody out to the store. You're trying to figure out, what can I do to be able to fix this, to salvage it? Uh, you know, oh, you know, the guests are coming over in 15 minutes or an hour's time, and things have not gone as I had planned. Well, you, you're not alone in having things not go the way you planned. The Almighty has it happened to him. That things have not gone the way he planned, the way that he had seen things to be laying out. Now, certainly, he does not get stressed out as we do. I mean, you know, he told us, don't be anxious about some of these things. You know, take, take no thought of, of this because you can't add a cubit to your stature. But your Heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. So things don't go even the way that God has planned and the way that God has, uh, would like it to go because there's always that variable of what humans are going to do. Not, not a failure on his part, but just what, what are human beings going to do? And he knows what human beings will ultimately do, but he still has a plan. This is what my plan is. This is how I, it will be laid out. And so as we look in Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah culminates all the things uh, in the book of Zechariah that we've read about from the visions from the very beginning all the way to now. It's now culminated in this chapter, and it says that the day of the Lord is coming in the day in which 
the spoil will be divided, that he's going to gather all the nations together against them that fight against Jerusalem. So there's a, a picture that is seen there. Again, after the Messiah will come. We've already read those things in chapters uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so forth. So after the Messiah will come, um, then we know that he will be crucified, he would leave, but then there's also going to be the reality of him coming back again. Okay, this is, this is, we see this in the book of Zechariah. In verse, in chapter 14, it says here in verse 1, though, that this great revival was taking place in Israel, which we talked about in chapter 12. Uh, that the fountain was open, that people came in, and we discussed it last week in chapter 13, that there would be many that would be led to God. That the false prophets would cease their prophecies. That when someone would come and ask them, they'd say, well, I, I, I don't do that type of business anymore. I'm a farmer. That's what I, I was. That's what I am. I don't, I don't teach it. I don't dabble in those things any, anymore. Why? Because I have been redeemed. I've gone to the fountain and I've been washed. So I'm different now than, than I was then. And the Gentiles would come to thy rising. The, the, the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And chapter 14 then says that the day of the Lord is coming and their spoil would be divided. And the enemies of the nations that would gather themselves on the outside against Jerusalem, they would come inside the city itself. And as they came inside the city itself, it said that the city would be taken, the houses plundered, and the woman would be ravished or raped. That's in verse 2. It further says that half of the city will go into captivity, but there's going to be a remnant of the people that shall not be cut off from the city. And so this is, is escalation point. This is, 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 this is escalating in what would take place in Jerusalem. So the situation does not look good. It looks dire that the city is taken. The houses are plundered. The women have been assaulted. Some of the women have been assaulted. Some would be slain, some would be taken into captivity, and yet then there would still be a remnant that would be there. Verse 3 says that then God is going to go out and fight on behalf of his people. He's going to fight on behalf of Jerusalem. He's going to fight on behalf of Israel as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, and it will make a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. Yes, ye shall flee and ye, as ye fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. So Zechariah shows how Christ will come. Right now he's coming not as the Messiah, but he will come back as king. And what is the background? What is the setting? Well, the setting is, is that Jerusalem is being plundered by its enemies. That all the nations have gathered around Jerusalem and they are plundering it. They're taking some people off into captivity. They're having their way and then Jehovah himself steps up. Jehovah shows up and he comes down to say, I'm now fighting on behalf of Israel. I'm going to fight on behalf of my people. In the New Testament, uh, this, this imagery is borrowed. Um, and the imagery that is borrowed uh, creates a battle uh, that is in Revelation chapter 16 that's referred to the Battle of Armageddon. So Revelation chapter 16 begins to describe this, this battle that would take place, the Battle of Armageddon. So if you turn over to Revelation, the 16th chapter, and starting uh, in the, I believe, the 14th verse, Revelation, the 16th chapter, uh, and notice how the Bible then describes in similar language what we've read over in the 14th chapter of the book of Zechariah. Revelation, the 16th chapter, and the Bible says, beginning in verse 16. Well, we'll look at verse 14. It says, there are the spirits of devils working miracles, 
which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to do what? To battle in the great day of God Almighty. 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The plain of Gedo, or the valley of Gedo, is, where, is what's on the screen, and this is the area uh, that is thought by many to be where the battle of Armageddon would take place. Now again, from Zechariah, the 14th chapter, Zechariah said that the battle would take place in what city? Jerusalem. And according to what we know from inspiration, had Israel remained faithful, Jerusalem would have stood forever, would have been the capital of the world. Zechariah describes a scene taking place of Jerusalem being plundered and God coming to the defense of Jerusalem against all the nations that would raise their hand against it. So this is a picture of what uh, Megiddo looks like. It's not a wide area, as you can see, very uh, small. But most in the Christian world centered the prophecy of Zechariah here, as well as that of Revelation chapter 16, the Battle of Armageddon. I'll talk about how those things come together in that line. But this is the, the, the area here. And so the idea is that here, this is where the end time battle between good and evil is going to take place in this area. And as men visualize it and see it, you picture then the idea of like a nuclear holocaust, destruction of the world, all taking place there in this particular area. Well, the Bible lets us know that, that there was a change that would take place, though. So we must go to the book of Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21. So, again, there was in Zechariah, this is what was going to take place. This is what the plan was. And we'll read further in the book of uh, Zechariah, chapter 14. We see that Jerusalem is in trouble, that a remnant is saved. Messiah shows up and brings deliverance to his people. In fact, we should probably read further in Zechariah so that it would be a little easier for you to understand. So before we go over to Matthew, if you turn back to Zechariah, the 14th chapter. Zechariah, the 14th chapter. And starting in the 6th verse, Zechariah, the 14th chapter, and picking up in the 6th verse. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at the evening time that it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea or toward the Dead Sea, and half of them toward the Hinder Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. In summer and in winter it shall be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be, how many lords? One Lord and his name what? His name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of the Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate into the place of the first gate, into the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel unto the king's wine press. Meaning it's just the, the border is just going to expand. So it's giving markers, like geographical markers. As you might say, well, this is a point in the south. This is a point in the north. This is the, the territory going to the east or the west. These are just geographic markers. And men shall dwell in it, verse 11, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely, what? Inhabited. So the, the, it's going to turn back around then, right? You see that. It's going to be plundered. It's going to be attacked. God is going to intervene. The waters of living water shall flow out. And it will be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite those that fight against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes 
shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a grateful tumult from the Lord shall be among them. They shall lay hold every one upon the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen nations shall be brought up together, together, gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the Lord and to keep the feast the feast of pass of tabernacles and it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the king the Lord of hosts even upon them shall be no rain and if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come up not up to keep the feast of tabernacles so there would be, in the deliverance of Israel, the nations would then re be repentant. Uh, nations would convert over from seeing God come in this great manner, seeing the plagues that, fall, that fell upon man and beast. Then some would then respond and turn unto him wholeheartedly. And he says that they would come up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Anciently, the Feast of Tabernacles took place after the Day of Atonement. And it was a celebratory experience. And so God was celebrating. They were being able to celebrate. And it was, it was a festival to remind them of, their, of Israel's time of sojourning in the wilderness. That they would, they, they would leave their homes and dwell in, in booths. And talk, and talk about just how, how good God was in bringing them deliverance and giving them salvation. And so now the heathen nations would come up again to celebrate this with them, to testify again of, of God's goodness and again in him bringing them into this promised land. They would be in agreement. And if some did not come, as in Egypt, it said that then there would be a cursings upon the water so that they would have famine. They would have devastation that would rest upon them because they did not come up to be able to worship the Lord and, and verse 20 says, in that day that there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots of the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar, or, or meaning that the horses uh, will come not in conflict of war, but they will come as messengers of peace. Lastly, verse 21 says, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed them. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of, of hosts. That word Canaanite means merchant. Um, it means merchant. We're not talking about a literal person um, that is, is there in terms of the Canaanites, but rather uh, talking of a merchant. Uh, meaning that no one's going to be excluded. Um, gathering in the pots, a lot of people coming in, and nobody is going to be excluded. Everybody's going to be included. And so really then, this would end what we would call the end of the world. Sort of there'll be destruction, hellfire, etc. But the context of how it would take place, this is what it would take place in Jerusalem. You have those people who would be converted, some that would not be converted. The nations of the earth would seek to rise up. Uh, they would meet destruction. Um, and those that were repentant would, be, would come and, part, and be a part of Israel. Those that were not would be destroyed. So that was the ending that was laid out by Zechariah. But as I said at the beginning, even God's plans don't go as God intends. But he can do something about it. But he does not interject himself to stop the madness of men. So this is his plan from Zechariah chapter 14. And as we, we see it then, we must then interpret it and seek to understand it based upon, again, the history that is given, but also the facts as they have unfolded thereafter. And this is where many people uh, get into a little bit of a problem. If you interpret Zechariah chapter 14 literally, 
then what we would anticipate then is a literal fulfillment of these things, i.e., that the nations of the earth are going to gather themselves around Israel, as in the Battle of Armageddon, and that there will be a revival that will take place uh, amongst uh, the, uh, the Israelites and that there will be the heathen that will come to seek to uh, uh, influence and to attack. And God will then uh, interpose at the end through the Messiah. Now, I'm going to show you just on a, a one slide that will make it easier probably for you to be able to follow along the, 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 the chain of thought. But in addition to doing that, we certainly want to be able to establish, well, what is it saying? What's going to happen then in respect of the end? Because there are many people who look at Zechariah chapter 14, and this is the basis that many place off of in conjunction with other texts like Joel, etc., that this is going to be what the end is like as relates to Israel. So now we'll put a stop there, and we have to pivot because, again, the plan was as such, but it did not take place because of the rejection of a nation. So we'll read in Matthew, the 21st chapter, these words. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you that the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to what? A nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Therefore say I unto you that the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given forth to a nation again bringing forth the fruits thereof. So Jesus warned and said, listen. The kingdom is going to be taken from you and, and given to a nation that's bringing forth fruit thereof, or fruit meet for repentance. It's not always going to be about Israel. Israel will have its day. And if we continue to transgress, if we continue to harden our hearts, if we continue to put our fingers and our ears against the counsel of God, then God will not forever sit by in, in, in indifference or in silence that is perceived. But God will raise up a nation unto himself, a nation of men and women in righteousness, a nation that had been formerly not a nation, a people that had formerly been not a people. He will call them and bring them into covenant relation with himself. So we read in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 7 through 9, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Back into Psalms, the cornerstone that was rejected by the builders, it now becomes the chief cornerstone. It had been laid aside in the building of the, of the temple, and they, they uh, had constructed it, and they'd been looking for a cornerstone, and, and according to uh, historians, it had been sitting there for centuries. And when it now was time to finish the temple, they needed a cornerstone, and the cornerstone had to be strong enough to be able to withstand the weight of the, of the building. If you didn't build it right, uh, and you put a stone that was not there, it would crumble, thus jeopardizing the entire structure. And, and if you've been in a home that the foundation is shot, you, you understand that. In California, in Southern California, uh, in the Bay Area, earthquake country, and so when you have a major earthquake, They'll come back in, then the inspectors will look at it to see if there's any structural damage. Because the house could look good on the outside, but if the foundation is messed up, then they'll, they'll we'll tag it. They call it red tagging it, saying that it's not safe to occupy. The temple that was built, it had to be strong enough. The stone, the cornerstone was going to carry the brunt of the weight of the building. So it had to be strong enough so that it would not crumble as dust. But also it had to be able to withstand the elements of nature because it would be the sun, things would contract. In the cool, uh, rather, uh, it would expand in the, in, the, in the sun and contract in the cool. So it must be able to do both of those things. And, and these builders, these engineers, as they were there, they knew that it had stood the test of time. It had been out for years, so it was not a question as to whether or not it could withstand the elements because it had already stood that test. But the big question was, can it take the weight? And when they moved it and put it into place, it was able to take the weight. And thus it became then the stone that the builders had rejected because they had been looking at this stone and saying, you know what, they've been looking for every, they tried everything else but this one. And sometimes our lives are like that. We try everything else but this one. 
And things may work for a while because in them trying those other stones, sometimes they, they did not instantly crumble. Some did, but some took them maybe a couple of days, but it didn't bear out. And we may try different relationships. We may try different things to be able to take the place. And it fizzles out, it peters out after a little bit of time because there's nothing that can take the place of Jesus. He is the stone that the builders had disallowed. And now he comes back in prominence because they put him to the side, but now the whole thing rests upon him. And so this is what Peter, again, is thus referring to in Jesus as well. A stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, even to them that stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A peculiar people. that You should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So understand now that that spiritual Israel or the Gentile nation is now brought in. Paul says in the book of Romans 11 that we are grafted into the vine. And if we've been grafted into the vine, then we're not to become haughty and to think that because we've been grafted in that we are, uh, we are given certain privileges beyond Israel. That God still loves Israel and that he's going to call many unto himself. And that was his heart's desire. But we were not to get big-headed and to think that, well, he's called us, therefore he needs us. He is duty-bound to us. But no, we are dispensable if they were dispensable as well. But God would not give up on them easily. Nor will Jehovah give up on any of us easily. So Zechariah chapter 14 then, uh, we must look at it then through a spiritual lens because now it goes from literal to spiritual. And there's the same emphasis that is there in some of those you will see clearly uh, conveyed in the New Testament. And so in Zechariah chapter 14, uh, again, we read of the gathering of the nations. I read it from Joel chapter 3. In Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, For I behold in those days, and in that, in, in that time, that I shall bring again the captivity of Jacob and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them. Therefore, my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Uh, God's going to gather the nations then unto himself. We read in the book of Revelation chapter 16 that the unclean spirits gather the nations together to battle against that great day of God Almighty. We're talking about the very same thing. Zechariah chapter 14, the gathering of the nations, and Ze in Revelation chapter 16, the gathering of the nations. Well, you say, well, hold it. In Zechariah, it says that God will gather the nations together. In Revelation, it says that who's doing this gathering of the nations the unclean spirits. Are they saying two different things? No, they're not saying two different things. They're giving two different perspectives. In the mind of the, the Hebrew, whatever God did not um, permit, he allowed. And so as it relates then to the battle of Armageddon, uh, he is allowing the nations together because they have rejected and they have spurned him. And so he is gathering them together because they have spurned him. The medium that is being used uh, is the, are the three unclean spirits. They're coming now to seek to fight against Jerusalem. Not literal Jerusalem now at the end, but rather spiritual Jerusalem they shall be gathered again to fight by. Now, before we go into the correct understanding, I'll give you the, the purview, of course, if you're just looking at it and reading it and how it will seem to play out. From the evangelical perspective, we read it or it is read that the nations of the earth are going to fight against Jerusalem. And so that's why when nations such as Iran manifest hostility toward Israel, that's why when the, the conflict that is there in the Middle East um, over fighting over the, uh, the Gaza Strip, that, that Christians in particular become concerned because they view this as potentially escalating the, the conflict of the last days. And so they see it again as a literal war that is going to take place in Palestine, that all the nations are going to gather. And so when you had the buildup that took place during the Gulf War, multiple nations or multi, a multi-national effort took place where all of the 
nations went into the Middle East. You remember that uh, desert storm. And so to evangelicals, this was, this was like a warning. This was, hey, wait a minute. This is, it's going down. Why? Because Zechariah said that the nations are going to be gathered together to fight against Jerusalem. And I, Iraq is not that far from Israel. So they saw this then as, a, as, the, as an opening, as a fulfillment of prophecy. Because they, they interpreted it literally. So then these nations that went over there, that now um, they're in that area. There's this conflict there. You know, just the same as you, you have church members today who would take uh, the mark of the beast and they will interpret it based off of uh, mandates. Uh, they, they'll look and say, well, COVID. They'll pick out something and, and that'll be their interpretation. They go headlong, uh, full bore into it. This is the same thing that, that our evangelical brothers and sisters did. They said, well, it is literally a battle that is there. The nations are gathered around. This is the end time. This is how they understand it, how they perceive it, the gathering of it. Well, in end time, you know, how we look at uh, eschatology, there's also uh, a view of eschatology as well that is shared. And so uh, this is not a correct view. So let me say that in case you're trying to grab a picture or whatever. I want you to know what you're looking at. So I'm not an advocate or a proponent of what is here, but I am sharing it so it makes sense what we're talking about. Okay. So in the evangelical layout of things, they see that we're living in the, you know, the present age, which is here, of course, right now. Uh, meaning again, we're living in the last days. They also will say that we're living in the last days. Uh, for them, though, the next event that takes place is what? The rapture of the church. All right. So you remember in the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter, it speaks about the 70 week prophecy. And so to Christians, they agree with everything going all the way down to that, you know, 69th week. So that 69th week is essentially removed from its sequential order, and then it's put all the way down into the future at the end of time. So we'll say, in other words, the 70 weeks begin in 457. And when it goes all the way down, and it ends the 69th week, ends in uh, 26 A.D., right? From there, we add in the next week that will follow. Because when you're counting, you say, you know, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, etc. In the evangelical community, uh, the, the Christians take that 70th week and apply it into the future. Okay? And that future begins at the end of time. And so that all the events that are related in that 70th week will still be fulfilled, but they'll be fulfilled in the future. So when we read it in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, it speaks about in the middle of the week that he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease, uh, that the abomination of desolation uh, is there apparent. That is interpreted then to refer to the work of the Antichrist. I'll read it for you, Daniel 9, and I'll read in verse uh, 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, but the prince, people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the ends thereof are determined with the flood. And the end to the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and the offerings. And, the, um, and on the wing of the abomination shall be, shall be one who makes desolate, even to the consummation which is determined, is poured upon the desolate. Now, if you're reading from the King James Version, uh, it reads this way. 
Same verse, Daniel 9 and verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And so that last week, that 70th week, is put down into the future. So just to keep it simple, for simple math, we'll say then the year 2020, just because seven years is easy. So it's that last week, so it's seven years, and so you've heard of the seven-year tribulation before probably. So this is, the, this is where this comes from. It's a, it's a concept in prophecy called futurism um, that was created by um, Alcazar to be able to put these ideas into the future. So it was to take the, the identity and the, the working of what would take place. And you saw looking at history and prophecy, you have different view, schools, schools of interpretation. Um, you have like um, a historicist view that we look at history to be able to find the fulfillment of it. And we recognize that there's still some things that will happen in the future. And you have like a preterist view that puts fulfilled prophecy in the past. Then there's like a futurist view that will take prophecy, fulfill prophecy, and put it in, into the future. And the danger of those uh, two schools of preterism and futurism is that you deny the historical fulfillment of it or you put things without its, not in its proper context. So this 70th week is put into the future. So just, again, mathematically keeping it simple, 2020, then seven years. If it started in 2020, then it would end in 2027, right? That's seven years. So uh, they say we're living in the present age of the earth. So I'll just change the years now just to make it make a little more sense. So we're in 2022 right now. So according to, to this theory then, today the rapture could take place. And the rapture would be, again, not Jesus coming visibly the second time, but Jesus rapturing the saints. And so in this context, the church is spared going through the tribulation of the last days because they're raptured, okay? So if it's 2022 and a rapture takes place 10 minutes from now, uh, then basically the righteous that are here upon the earth, they're going to go to heaven. The righteous living, they're going to go to heaven. The righteous dead also going to go to heaven. Um, the wicked living will be on the earth. And so they're just walking around like, hey, where's the, the Buddhists normally come back from church this time of day? Where are they? Like nobody sees them. Uh, somebody's looking, you know, going downstairs, uh, calling out for their husband and wife, don't see them. Uh, plane is flying. The pilot looks over to the co-pilot to ask for a question, and nobody's there. And so it's going to be complete, you know, pandemonium and chaos because you, unless you have maybe a Tesla or something that's like automated self-driving, you're going to have a bunch of cars crashing on the streets because there's no human to occupy the drive it, right? They're gone. And so according to Luke, then it's like, well, where are they taken? One is left and one is taken. You know, one, two men shall be, um, or two women shall be grinding. One's taken, one's left. Two men are in the bed together. One is taken and one is left. In this, one is taken to heaven. One is left behind. So that's the, symbolized by the rapture. And so then as that takes place then, the natural response it would be that those that are left behind are thinking and saying, oh, you know, this is the rapture. This is what they were talking about all this time, and I, I didn't believe it. I put it off. But it's now happened, so I better get right. And then a great revival takes place through the earth. So people start hearing about uh, the gospel, um, and they are now turning to God. The temple is, is rebuilt in Jerusalem and restored back. And three and a half years into that, uh, and, and there are plagues, by the way. The first, um, the uh, revelation, uh, when it talks about the, the, uh, the trumpets uh, and the seals, it's believed that they are open during this three and a half years. So the earth is in chaos. Okay, so you have these... Uh, judgments coming down, these things that are happening, and people are repenting and turning to God, and the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem. And then in the three middle of that week, remember, it says he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, the desecration, the abomination to make of desolate. Paul says that the Antichrist, the man of sin, is going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is who? That he is God. And in this thought, this a charismatic leader is the Antichrist. 
And he's, he sets up his reign and he brings in a desecration of the temple in the midst of this three and a half uh, years, which is identified by here. And then that plunges the world into another period of three and a half years of great tribulation. Okay, this is a time period now when the plagues fall down from heaven and so forth. Okay? And in this, then this is when Zechariah chapter 14 is fulfilled. So the setup of it is, is all these things are happening, and now the nations of the earth are gathering against Jerusalem. Because, again, the Antichrist has made his appearance there. All the world is gathered there, and all these things are happening for three and a half years. And then, um, according to what is pictured there and by uh, the, their teachings, then you have the visible return of Jesus. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is like, you know, how, how, they, how it's laid out from... Uh, from Zechariah, Malachi, and so forth. And uh, once he appears, then you have Christ reign for a thousand years. And this is uh, the layout that is there. But let's look very quickly uh, to what is actually taking place. So first, in Zechariah chapter 14, the 14th chapter of Zechariah. So we've seen that again. That is their uh, perspective as to what shall be. Now, in the book of Zechariah, again, it was telling us what the plan would have been. This is not how the plan will be. Now, this is like your, this is plan A, but this is not how the plan will be because Israel failed. It all hinges on the fact that Israel failed as a nation. So now it's plan B that will come into effect. And so as we start looking through it then in, in Zechariah chapter 14, then we have to understand that we have to see it now, not through the prism of what would have been, and it's important to understand what would have been. So we can know again what would have been literally is all in Zechariah chapter 14. There would have been this literal gathering there. Literal Jerusalem would have been attacked. People would have died. People would have been saved. People would have been converted. The nations that did not respond, they would be cut off. The Messiah would appear. Uh, not as the Messiah, but as the king. Christ coming the second time in power and in great glory to set up his kingdom. And there will be one God that shall reign over all the earth. That was what would have been. But that didn't go that way. And so when we look in Zechariah 14 again, a few verses just to, uh, to quickly draw the parallel from um, verse 2. We read it again that the nations will be gathered together to battle against Jerusalem. Now, if you go over quickly to, to the book of Revelation, chapter 16, we read it before. We'll not read it in its entirety, but I'll reference a few portions there. Revelation, chapter 16. So as we understand then, uh, how will this take place in terms of in time as relates to the book of Revelation, etc.? Well, the battle of Armageddon, it begins at the second coming of Jesus. And it is fully realized after the great judgment scene, uh, when the millennium is over. It says that the nations will gather against Jerusalem. And the word against uh, Armageddon uh, that is used, it, it is not a literal place. I showed you on the map what they look at is, is Megiddo. That's Megiddo. There is no mountain called Armageddon. It's a transliteration, a combination of two Hebrew words, R, a, a, uh, A-R, which means mount. And Megiddo means slaughter. It's word imagery that John is drawing by telling us what the outcome is going to be. And when you look throughout the Old Testament, when you see Megiddo spoken of, it is a literal place. And as it is spoken of, it is talk, talked about as being a place where kings had died in battle, where there was bloodshed, etc., or a complete slaughter. You can read it in Judges chapter 4, Judges chapter 5, etc., or etc., uh, it is listed there. And so when we go in Revelation, the idea, the imagery is again being borrowed. John is borrowing this as to what shall be, as to what will take place. So in verse 13, he talks about the wicked being gathered together to battle in the day of God in this battle that is called the Battle of Armageddon. That's Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. They are gathered by the spirits of demons, working miracles, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle, uh, to, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So Jesus will come the second time. When he comes according to the Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we know that before that, the world was going to be plunged in a deep time of distress. When Christ appears... He is going to bring redemption to the saints and destruction to the wicked. 
The righteous living according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are going to be translated. The righteous dead will be raised back to life. The wicked living will be slain from the brightness of his coming. The wicked dead will continue to sleep for a thousand years. And so that thousand years transpires, the saints are in heaven, the wicked are upon the earth. Um, that is when Revelation chapter 20 takes place, a thousand year period of the judgment, the reviewing of the books and so forth. At the end of that thousand years, Revelation chapter 21, John says that he saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. Now in, Zachari in Zechariah chapter 14, we read that Christ is going to step out on the, the Mount of Olives and it's going to become a mighty plain. We read that, right, in, in the book of Zechariah chapter 14. So Christ steps out then in the end uh, um, uh, on the Mount of Olives because he doesn't touch the earth until it's been purified by fire. Well, at his second coming, fire proceeds forth from him. Uh, it's not destroying the whole earth, but the earth is smoldering during this time period, okay? And so he, he comes and he, um, he uh, the area opens up into a mighty plain and the new Jerusalem descends and sits there. According to Revelation chapter 21 and 20, maybe we, should, we, we will turn there, Revelation chapter 20 and 21, so that you can, can read and see it. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. It says, And the thousand years are expired, and Satan will be released from his prison, and loose out of his prison. He shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Uh, that, would, again, would reference Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And Gog and Magog here are not talking about Russia, but it's a symbol of the wicked, just the wicked being raised back to seek to attack the people of God. They're raised back to life when the thousand years have expired. And they're gathered together to battle. Again, the same thing, which parallels not by picking words, but by seeing the context of it. The, these are people gathered to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And the Bible says in verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and say, Surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So the wicked at the end are going to gather themselves to fight against the city. Now, uh, we said in the beginning that the evangelical mindset is that all the nations of the earth were going to be gathered against Palestine to fight against it. Now, what we've read now in Revelation, will all the nations of the earth be gathered together in one place? Think of it, what we just read. It, it is a trick question, but it is not a trick question. In Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 7, the thousand years are expired. Satan is loosed out of his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations which are gathered or in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they surround the camp of the saints of the beloved city. So the wicked are seen. They are described as surrounding the camp of the beloved city. So the question is, is this in Jerusalem or in one place? Or is this all over the world? Okay, so if it's... if. Where is, the, where is when, when the earth is made over, is New Jerusalem going to be all over this world? Or is it going to be in one place? The, the New Jerusalem. It's in one place. It's going to be in one place. Okay. New Jerusalem is going to be in one place. So if they are gathered around the city, is that all over the world or is that in one place? One place. So it's one place. Okay. So it's one place they're gathered in. So please don't mix it up. Okay, I'm not saying that second, to be clear, uh, what I am saying is this. When Jesus comes the second time, that is like the beginning of the battle of Armageddon. But that's all over the world. Uh, all over the world. Um, all the world, uh, wherever else. And so the Bible makes it clear that when he appears, every eye is going to be able to see him.
Okay, all over the world. And the slain of the Lord will be from one end of the earth all the way into the other end of the earth. Again, the context we're talking about is the second coming of Jesus. Now when we go in Revelation chapter 20 and 21, the picture is now that New Jerusalem, it, it descends. And you can read in Great Controversy, New Jerusalem, it descends. And Christ steps out from it, and uh, in the mighty Mount of Olives, it splits and it becomes an open plain. And that's again where, according to Revelation chapter 20, this great judgment scene takes place. Right? This is where Christ is coronated. When you read those descriptions and so forth, in the great controversy and so forth. And so at the end of it then, of the coronation of Christ, and when the, uh, the scenes are displayed and everyone sees the role that they have played, um, that is, again, that the righteous will bow down as well as the wicked and say, just and true are thy ways, Lord God Almighty. They will acknowledge that Christ indeed is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, uh, through, or Paul said that every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow. This is to be fulfilled. After that is done, then when the wicked rise up, Satan then tells them, then let's go and take the city. And it is that point where Revelation chapter 20 says that now fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. So I submit to you then that the fulfillment of it then in the, the gathering of the city is in one place. That is in one locale that this will take place, the final annihilation of sinners. Now, again, the fire is going to burn over the entire world. But the annihilation in the final battle will take place there. The, the nations of the earth will be gathered. So not in the context of what uh, it, the evangelical brothers and sisters portray, but one piece carrying over to the next. Well, how do we know? Well, because the scriptures give us that carryover. The difference will be, though, the difference will be that in the, the, the layout of Zechariah, there was uh, the, the people they, in the inside of the city were attacked. In the Revelation account, the wicked do not go inside this, the, the New Jerusalem. In the Zechariah account, uh, there was a river that flowed out. In the Revelation account, the river of life, it flows out. Uh, Ezekiel talked about this water going out to uh, repopulate and to replenish the earth, that this is seen, that this is done, it carries through. Uh, the culmination of it again is that now at the end of it in the Zechariah account, Christ is established as being king and that righteousness reigns. In the Revelation account, Christ, again, is established as being king, and righteousness reigns. Wickedness is now consumed, and righteousness is what is, is alone is exalted in that time and in that day. So this was not fulfilled as what Zechariah said, but there are different principles, uh, characteristics that carry over. And how do we know which ones carry over? We have to let the prophets tell us. We have to let the prophets tell us. And in doing so, then we are safe to be able to see well, what, uh, what was, what would have been, versus what we see that shall be. In conclusion, when Christ comes or returns as king, he would defeat his enemies and establish his kingdom over all the earth. We will suffer, but God will place his hand upon us. And that's what we see there in the book of Revelation. We see that also in Zechariah. In spite of circumstances, Messiah is still king of kings and lord of lords. And that's, again, what Zechariah was pointing out in this, in this finality. That when these things are transpiring, that God is still sovereign. That he is still watching over the affairs that take place on earth. And that he's going to step up in battle on behalf of his beloved. So also we remember that as well, that God will step up in battle on behalf of his church. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. God is ready to work through his people to bring about the fruit that he desires. His people will be built, we learn, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. And so this will be uh, the culmination of Zechariah. Uh, we'll pray. And then I'll open up maybe for 10 minutes in case there are any questions. And uh, next week, then, we'll be ready for the book of Malachi. So let, let us pray and then, again, uh, open up for any questions if there are any. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, allowing us to be able to study the book of Zechariah. We, we've learned a lot of things, uh, some things that we had not understood before. 
uh, the opportunity of being able to discuss them and to, uh, to digest them. And I pray that you would be with each one of us and help us to go back and to re-examine and to see uh, if the conclusions that we've come to, that if they are correct. And if they're not, then lead us and guide us because we want to know uh, what is right from wrong. Uh, we want to be guided in your word and your will. One thing we know for certain, Lord, is that you are coming soon and that you're coming for people that have been purified. And you reminded the people through Zechariah that this building of the temple could never be accomplished by just human effort alone. It had to be done by your spirit. And so we pray again today, God, for your spirit, because we can't do this on our own. Remind us, help us to see that all of our best efforts are futile, not by our might, not by our power, but by your spirit. And so to your spirit and to his beckoning call, we surrender all to Jesus. We bless and keep us, we pray.